Hello and welcome to part four of Start Here. Start Here is a, a series that we're doing introducing the basics of the Christian faith. My name's Wayne Clark. I'm the pastor at Trinity Baptist Church. Uh, that's in Gorton in Manchester, on the east side of Manchester. Um, I've been a Baptist minister for 30 years and in that time I've learned a bit about Christian faith and the, the basics of what the Christian faith is about, read the Bible and I've taught the Bible over the years. So I'm hoping to be able to put together some of that experience and understanding in this series of the basics of the Christian faith. What is Christianity all about? What do Christians believe and do? And we're a bit limited what we can do in this uh, this space of Facebook Live, but uh, so it will be mainly be me, be me talking, but please put your comments down here. We'll try and make this interactive and uh, answer some comments as we go along. If you've got anything you want to respond to me privately, then then do uh, give me a private message or an email or get in touch with me through our church Facebook site or our um, our church website. Then do do that. We're Trinity Baptist Gorton. I'm sure you can find us. We call these sessions Start Here because uh, the Christian faith is a journey that we can start wherever we are. We don't have to fulfil a particular requirement. You can put down your signpost and say, I'm starting here wherever you are and start on that journey. Uh, wherever you are, here is a good place to start in matters of faith. And uh, it's not about getting the answers right. It's just about joining along in this journey of finding out uh, what there is to know and this journey that we can walk together. So session one in Start Here was about Jesus, who is the crucial all in all of our Christian faith. Session two was about the Bible, which is the uh, the source material for our Christian faith. What we believed is the inspire, inspired word of God, the inspired document, a set of writings that have been uh, read by Christians and people of uh, uh, seeking truth over thousands of years and in it have found God speaking to them. So we did a session about the Bible. Session three was about following Jesus, what it means to hear Jesus's instruction, follow me, and what it means to believe in Jesus, to have faith in Jesus, uh, not just to believe a certain number of facts, but to put our wholehearted faith in Jesus as Lord. That was session three, which we did on Tuesday. And all of those sessions you can find on uh, on Facebook, on the Trinity Baptist Gorton Facebook page, and on YouTube. Uh, if you go to YouTube and search Trinity Baptist Gorton, you can find them there. There's a playlist called Start Here, which has all our videos, the ones I've just described to you. Today, part four, the final part of this series, is God's new community, the church. God's new community. Not the, uh, not what you think it might be. What do you think when you hear the word church? Does it make you grimace? Or do you think of particular things? Do you think of nice looking buildings or scruffy looking buildings? Do you think of the church as a building? Or do you think of the church as a religious organization an institution like the catholic church or the church of england or the methodist church do you think of the church in terms of an organization an institution with rules and regulations and leaders or do you think of a particular group like um you know the, the, the this particular pentecostal church or this particular methodist church when I say the church today, I, I, I don't want to think of any of those things. I'm not thinking of an institution or an organisation. I'm not thinking of buildings. I'm not thinking of a, of a historical sense of the, the church. I'm thinking of what the Bible says when it uses the word church and how we in our generation can capture the excitement, the community, the sense of belonging to what the Bible calls the church. So allow me to illustrate that. I've got three parts to this. The first one's a bit longer, and then we're going to stop in the middle for some questions and comments if you've got them, and then go on to parts two and three. Three things that the church is, according to, as Christians understand it, according to the Bible. 
And the first one, uh, this is this is the crucial thing. The church is God's people. When the Bible uses the word church, it means the people who are committed to Jesus, the people who are Jesus people. Christianity is the Christ movement. The word Christianity begins with the word Christ, which refers to Jesus Christ. And the church is the people of Christ. The church is God's people. The church is made up of people. Peter, one of Jesus's leading followers, was in a poetic mood when he wrote about this. He wrote about the church in his second letter, which is found in the Bible. And he says to the people of God, the church, he says, you, the church, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you are not a people, but now you are the people of God. Wow, that's quite flowery language, but it's beautiful description of what Peter, how Peter understands what he calls the church. And Peter was the one to whom Jesus first said, on this rock I will build my church, when Peter declared his faith in Christ. So Peter should know. And Peter says the church is these chosen people, royal priesthood. I'm not going to go into all the details of what that means. What I'm saying is this. The Bible says the church is a particular group of people. The Bible word for church, its literal meaning is the people who are called out and called together. It's a gathering of people. So when the Bible uses the word church, we need to think of it in those terms. It means a group of people who belong to Jesus and belong to each other. It's a community of faith a community of people who have faith in the Lord Jesus. Sometimes when the Bible uses that word, it means uh, a group. We take it to mean a fairly smallish group who met together week by week. But sometimes it means all the Christians in one town. So Paul writes to the church as the Christians, the, the believers in Jesus in one place. So he might write to the Galatian churches, meaning all the believers in Christ who meet together in one place in that region of the, the world, that region that was in those days called Galatia. He says that in 1 Corinthians 16, if you want to look it up. So he talks about the churches in that place or the churches in the province of Asia in that same chapter. Or in Romans 16, he says, all the churches of Christ. And he doesn't mean institutions or organizations he certainly doesn't mean buildings because there were no christian buildings no ind independently built buildings for churches to meet in in those days he means all those gatherings of god's people in paul's times those local churches seems to seem to have met in smaller gatherings usually in people's homes and in those days, the homes of most people would have met around a courtyard. So the building would have been here, courtyard in the middle. And it seems that people would, first of all, have met in the courtyards inside people's homes. They would have met in, in the open air, but the weather was better than ours. <laughs> they would have met in places where they could just gather in smaller groups with the, with the sun on their heads and uh, being the church in one place. So we, we have lots of references in the Bible to the church you meet in this person's house or in this person's home. This is where church is met. But the church wasn't the place. It wasn't as if that building became the church. The church is always the gathering of people. It was centuries later that Christians started to have um, buildings to meet in. And then those buildings started getting called churches because the church met in that building but we always need to remember that it's the the people who are the church and not the building you know i wish we could have a different word in english for a, a building that is a worship place for christians to meet in um, i mean we have kind of we've got the word chapel and some uh, church 
groups call their building a chapel. The Welsh churches particularly will call their their building a chapel. Um, the church I grew up in called their building their building they met in the chapel. Um, but the word chapel is used in different ways. For in some uh, in some contexts, a chapel is a a room within a church, um, and and or a an offshoot of a church. So that can be confusing as well. I think we're just stuck with the words we've got at the moment. If the church is usually used to mean a group of Christians meet who meet in one place, the other way the New Testament uses the word church is to refer to all Christians everywhere. So in Ephesians 3, Paul uses the word to uh, the church to mean all of God's people. He says, through the church, the wisdom of God has been made known. And in the same chapter, he says, glory to God in the church. And we might say that's church with a capital C. Not Certainly not a building, but not in this case, just one group, but all the people of Jesus everywhere. Sometimes we call that the universal church. All the people all over the world. And you could say all the people throughout history who trust in Jesus are part of the church with a big C the universal church. And this church, wherever they are in the world, are the church with us, with those of us today who are part of a church or to be a part of the capital C church. How do we become part of the church? Not by entering into a doorway. That isn't the church. The church is entering into a metaphorical doorway, which is believing in Jesus. We talked about this on Tuesday. When we become a Christian, we repent. That means we turn our lives around through the power of God. We believe in Jesus, not just believing something about Jesus, but believing in Jesus. We are baptised as a mark of that entry into the life of faith and entry into his people, the church. And we receive the Holy Spirit. And in this way, we become part of the church, the church universal. We become part of this new community of God's people. You and I are the church if we have faith in Christ. And if you want to become part of a church or the church, the only way to do it is by having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be asked to become a a member of your church or to become uh, on enter onto the church role of your church those are different things those are to do with the way your church might be organized i'll talk about that in a moment but in terms of the way the bible speaks to it to become part of the church to become a mem to become a, a function to become a, a an operating part of your church to become part of the church of jesus christ the way to do that is through faith in Jesus Christ. And we become part of a, a worldwide community of God's people. The universal church is vast. About two billion people alive today are part of God's church. In many parts of the world, the church is persecuted. In some parts of the world, the church has to, what we call, go underground, not literally, but beneath the the official radar beneath the uh, the, the 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 observation the the, the networks that are happen that, that the officials know about but underground churches unofficial secret churches can be very strong in the western world the church has been in decline in our lifetime but in the developing world and in places where it is dangerous to be a Christian. The church is growing rapidly. Be encouraged, the church is growing throughout the world. I belong to part of the church which is uh, the Baptists. The, the, we are part, uh, the church I belong to is part of the Baptist Union of Great Britain and, uh, the, and Baptists tend to talk about the church, the local church, as the gathered community. People gathered together by God to belong together and to serve God together. 
It's not about where you live. It's not uh, in terms of the parish that you belong to. We don't talk in those terms. We talk about being gathered together by God to be the church who are called together to belong together and to work and serve together. And we in our church, in our church networks, express that belonging by church membership, where we agree to accept one another into the, the, the body of the church who are in covenant relationship with one another in membership, where we listen to one another and make decisions together as church members. And Baptist churches are led by God through our meetings of church members, what we call congregational government. And we emphasise church as community of God's people. And Baptists tend to use the word church only in two senses, either to mean the local group, the local church, or all Christians anywhere, all Christians all over the world. So we don't tend to use the word church to mean any institutions between the two. So we call our national organisation the Baptist Union. It's a union of churches. It isn't a church, the way the Church of England might call itself the Anglican Church. But there are different ways of expressing church in different traditions. What's important is that we are the people of God. I wonder how that applies to you. How can you make sure that you think of the church as people and not building and not institution and not rules and regulations, but as people who belong together? I'm Wayne Clark. This is Start Here. This is part four of our series called Start Here on the basics of the Christian faith. We've talked about Jesus. We've talked about the Bible. We've talked about what it means to follow Jesus, crucially. And I talked in that session on Tuesday about following Jesus, that when we follow Jesus, we become part of his people, the church. So that's what I'm talking about today. I wonder if you've got any comments or any questions that you want to contribute let me just say hello to those who are following us hello Jonathan hello Wayne hello Chris Chris Bowater Wayne Grucock Barbara again Anita again hello 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 I'm just waving back to some of these people now that, and we're halfway through I just want to um, give you two pictures from the picture language uh, illustrations from the Bible about what how the Bible talks about church. Just to illustrate really what we've been saying so far. If you disagree with me, let me know. But here's the second half of what I want to say today based around two word pictures of the Bible, of from the Bible, of what the church is. And the first one is that the church is, according to the Bible, the church is God's family. This new community of faith is like a family of which God is at the head, at the heart. Now we're not all comfortable with the concept of family, I understand that, but this is not like any human family, although in some ways it is because human families let us down and so does the church sometimes let us down, but this is different because we are drawn together by God into his new family. The Bible says that when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, we become children of God. He gave us the right to be children of God, it says in John chapter 1. This is what gives the church its unity. We have God as our Father, Jesus Christ as our Saviour, who becomes our brother and the Holy Spirit in us. We all belong to one family. Now, just as brothers and sisters sometimes squabble and fall out and don't sometimes don't even see each other for long periods of time, they still remain brothers and sisters. Nothing can end that relationship. And in the same way, the church is one, even though it often appears to be divided. That doesn't mean we have to settle for disunity. Jesus prayed for his followers that they may be one. Like a divided family, we should all strive for that reconciliation. Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. That's in Ephesians chapter four. We work for unity as we work through our differences. 
but we also continue to remind ourselves that we are one family. As we get together for worship and work together, we grow nearer to one another. And the nearer we grow to one another, the nearer we grow to Jesus. And the nearer we grow to Jesus, the nearer we grow to one, to no to one another. As Christians, we are called to, here's another Bible word, we are called to fellowship. Our fellowship is with God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And our fellowship is with one another. And that fellowship can cut across barriers of race, of colour, of education, of background, of age, old and young, of male and female, of, of nationality, of language, and every other cultural barrier that the world might put up. Someone in our church was just saying the other day, how would a group like us ever come together if it wasn't for church? And it's true, it's probably true of every individual local church. Church is one of the very few places where older people and younger people and people from different cultural and racial and educational backgrounds come together. But church is meant to be God's new family, the place where people are drawn together. There are two things that you can't do on your own. You can't get married on your own. It takes two. And you can't be a Christian on your own. It involves others. The writer to the Hebrew urges his readers, he says, let's consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. The writer to the Hebrew says, as Christians, we have to meet together. That's what it's about. Not saying that being a, going to church makes you a Christian, because that isn't the way the Bible sees it. But it does say if you are a Christian, you belong to this new family. And if you neglect meeting together, your faith will diminish. It's a bit like a barbecue. When you get a barbecue going, you have to pile all the coals together in the middle. And then once you've lit them, they, the heat from each coal will, uh, will, will spread to the, it, the, the coal next to it and to the coals around it until all those little charcoal bits are, are burning brightly. And then if you spread them out, you still need to keep them touching one another. If you, if you spread them out too thinly, or if you take a, a coal out of the fire and put it down, what will happen to that coal that you, you've put away from the fire? It will go out and it will go cold. The same is true with us as Christians. We need to be in the fire. We need to be in the gathering of God's people. If we go away, we'll go cool, we'll go cold. When we come together and Jesus is with us, we, as it were, heat one another up <laughs> with the love of Jesus among us. We need one another. You and I need one another if we're Christians together. If you take us out of fellowship, even in these days of lockdown, we need one another. We often talk about church as the place we go to. Which church do you go to? Oh, I go to the church down the road. Oh, I go to this church. I used to go to that church, but now I go. But that's the wrong language to be using. Church isn't a place we go to. It isn't a building we attend. It isn't a, even a community we go to. It's something we're part of. It's something we each are an integral, important part of. It's God's family. And you don't go to a family, you're part of a family. We are God's new community of people who follow Jesus. And we are church, whether we're together or not. But being together creates and warms up that fellowship, that family feeling. So I said in this second half, I've got two pictures, two word pictures to illustrate what it is to be God's new community of the church. The first one is family. And this is the second one. It's a bit more abstract, a bit more complex, which is that we are the body of Jesus. We are Jesus on earth. We are, uh, the Bible says, we are like the body of Jesus on earth. Paul had been persecuted the Christian church and he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. And, and Paul said, uh, Jesus said, Saul, why are you, Saul was his other name, why are you persecuting me? And Paul had never met. Jesus. 
We don't think Paul had, was persecuting Jesus. Paul was persecuting Christians, the church. And then Paul realized that by persecuting Christians, he was persecuting Jesus because the church was, in effect, the body of Jesus on earth. And Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, develops that picture in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, you, you people, you community in Corinth, you are the body of Jesus. And just like a body, we're not all the same. He says a body has different parts which each have their own role. A hand and a nose have a different purpose. Each one has a different place in it in the body, but each one is vital. The idea of a body where every person in the church has a part to play is a is a is a, a lovely illustration. It reminds us that we're all important, but we're all different, that we're all significant for the health of the body. But each one of us has a different, uh, an individual role to play according to the gifts and skills that we have. And some are seen as seen as more significant and seen as some, as some, some we hardly know. There's bits of your body that you don't even know you've got. But if you didn't have them, you'd be, you'd be, well, you wouldn't be alive. And it's the same with the church. There's bits of the church that you don't even know are doing what they're doing, but they are doing those things to help the body to survive and to thrive and to do its work. People, the church and every part of it is important, just like a body. If you've got things that you can contribute to your community, your church, then get on and do it. The Bible says that the church is given gifts through individuals. Individuals are given skills and talents that the Bible calls gifts of the spirit that we can each use for the good of the whole, the good of the body. The Bible said it's good for the church to have leaders, but being a leader isn't about being more important. It's about having that role to play within the, the body, within the church. Different gifts that the whole church can use, some of which are leadership gifts, but they're not to be used boastfully or to think that you're more important than anyone else. They're simply a gift that that church needs at that time. In our Baptist churches, and again, I'm speaking from my perspective, but different churches have different perspectives on this. In our Baptist churches, we have uh, leaders who are also in, in full-time work, and then we have leaders who are set aside. Often we call them ministers who have a particular function. But within our setup, there's nothing that a minister does that any other Christian couldn't do, given the recognition of that person by the local church. There's nothing special in that sense about that person. That person simply has been assigned that role to do by that church and respected for that role that they have because of the recognition of their gifts and skills of ministry. But we're all special. We're all special and we all have gifts to use and a part to play. However that works in your church or in any church you might join, remember we all have special parts to play in the life of our community. Every Christian is part of the church, capital C. And every Christian is called to be a significant part of a local church, part of the body. The church is you and me. It's not some organisation. It's not some building we attend. It's not some other people. It's you. It's each of us. What role, what part are you playing? How gifts, how are your gifts and skills being used in the community that you are called to serve and be served by and be part of. Perhaps you're watching this saying, well, I'm not just in the lockdown, but all the time I'm shut in. I'm, I, I haven't got much to offer. We all have things to offer. Prayer for others is something to offer. A bit of encouragement to others is something really special to offer. Encourage your leaders. Encourage those who have a responsible task to play within your community. 
even if that's not you anymore, or even if it's not you at all, encourage others, share what you can do with others. Anyway, we've come a long way from where we started this Start Here series, but I want to say to you, if you are investigating the Christian faith, that the church is the new community of God's people and should be, if I can put it in this way, the greatest selling point of Christianity. Yeah, when you have faith in the unfailing love of Jesus Christ and his grace to give you new life, you get this new supportive community of Jesus people. That's part of what it is to follow Jesus. You gain so much of this supportive community of Christian people. And yet I know it doesn't always feel like that. I apologize when church has gone wrong and when church has hurt people and when church has upset people and turned people away from Jesus. You know, even good people sometimes get it wrong. And sometimes bad people are involved for their own aims as well. But when we get it right, we can find the love of Jesus among his people and the acceptance and the that, that word again, fellowship, which is not just about being nice to one another. It's about truly valuing and supporting one another. And it, it's a wonderful thing when it works well and you can make it better <laughs> if your church isn't perfect which no church is then you can improve it by your part in it if you have faith in Jesus and that's where it starts if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and come into relationship with him then you can get all the benefits of knowing that you are part of this new community of faith, this movement for transformation, this outcrop of heaven here on earth. You can be part of that. It's an exciting place to be, an exciting community to join. That's what it is to be part of God's new community, the church. I think that's all from me today. You got any comments and questions? Hi to everyone who's joining us. Hi, Vori. Hello, Anita. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Arthur. We had lots of people joining us today, but I haven't seen any particular comments or questions that um, will engage us all. Thank you for your best wishes and for your thanks and for those who have engaged with us today. I'm Wayne Clark from Trinity Baptist Church in Gorton. Uh, please do join us on our website, on our Facebook page. Look up Trinity Baptist Gorton on Facebook. Uh, some of you are there already. Uh, this is Start Here, and if you want to see the rest of our Start Here series, they're on our Facebook page, Trinity Baptist Gorton, or you may want to look us up on YouTube. That's a more convenient way for people to find us. Go to youtube.com and then search Trinity Baptist Gorton. And you'll find all our videos and uh, there's a playlist of Start Here. It's got a picture of a little windy path on it if you're looking for that. And today we've been talking about the new community of God we call the church. But please do look at those. And if you want to make a response to any of those, please do get in touch with me. I'd love to answer your questions or speak to you personally. If you want to contact me through email, through uh, Facebook Messenger, in, or in any other way, I'd love to hear from you. We're going to finish now. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is me, Wayne Clark, signing off and saying thank you for being with us through this series of Start Here and being with us today. If you stayed the course, well done. Thank you very much, and God bless you, and goodbye. Bye. <laughs>